Good evening. I have uh, looked forward to tonight for quite a while, and I'm so glad to see you here. Uh, I'm thankful that you've joined us for our 18th annual Azusa Lecture. And uh, I always enjoy these occasions. We do our best to bring a uh, speaker uh, that will inform us and inspire us and do our best to honor an exemplary spiritual leader. And so we're going to do that tonight. So sit back, relax, enjoy the evening. Don't sit back if Jonathan asks you to sing, but uh, other than that. And after we're finished, we'll have some wonderful uh, food downstairs in honor of the bears. So I'm um, thankful you're here. Uh, let me pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here tonight. You have blessed us with breath and with the ability to come. And Lord, we just thank you for all of your many gifts. We're here tonight to celebrate your renewing work and are thankful to be part of what you're doing around the world. So we ask that you honor us with the presence of the Holy Spirit and that by your grace, all that we do will glorify you in heaven and on earth. And we pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, tonight's lecture is sponsored by the Dixon Pentecostal Research Center. And uh, if you've been here before, you've heard me say that our mission is to join with the psalmist in 78, Psalm 78, 4. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord. We will tell of his power and the mighty miracles he did. And so in order to do that, at the Dixon Pentecostal Research Center, we collect records and documents and stories and make them available to students and scholars and to our children and to our grandchildren. Now, history reveals that as the 19th century came to a close and the 20th century was dawning, that God was at work in many places around the world. In our own Church of God history, we know of the great revival, the holiness revival at the Sheriff Schoolhouse, just some 50 miles from here. And the, the revival that continued for several years with persecution and with an outpouring of the Spirit and ultimately resulted in the formation of the Holiness Church at Camp Creek what ultimately became the Church of God. So we're aware of that, and we're aware, if you were with us last year, you heard Dr. Julie Martinez talk about other places in the world where the Holy Spirit was being poured out. But we've named our lecture, Azusa Lecture, in honor of the revival that occurred at the Azusa Street Mission in Los Angeles in 1906. Um, our own historian, Dr. Charles Kahn, wrote that this revival is universally regarded as the beginning of the modern Pentecostal movement. He didn't mean by that it was the only revival. He didn't mean it was the first. He didn't mean it was the last. But because of its location, because of its length, people around the world heard about what God was doing. Well, what did God do there? On February 22nd, 1906, an African-American minister by the name of William Joseph Seymour arrived in Los Angeles by train. He intended to be pastor of the Santa Fe Holiness Mission. He was convinced that God was pouring out his spirit in the last days before the return of Jesus and that speaking in tongues was in fact the Bible evidence of the spirit baptism experience. When he began preaching that message, however, the church that he had come to pastor rejected the message and locked him out. What was he to do? Well, thankfully, the Edward Lee family invited him to stay at their home, and the Asbury family invited him to hold prayer meetings in their home on Bonnie Bray Street. Seymour preached the message, but had, did not yet have it himself. On Monday, April the 9th, Edward Lee and others began to experience the Holy Spirit in speaking in tongues. And people heard about it and crowds made their way to Bonnie Bray Street. So many, so, so many that it became disruptive to the neighborhood and so they had to find another place to worship. 
and they located what had been a former Methodist church at 312 Azusa Street. News spread quickly, and soon people were coming from many places in the world to experience that revival. And that revival had an import right here in Cleveland, Tennessee. That same year, A.J. Tomlinson set in order just down the street. It was called College Street at the time. The North Cleveland Church of God. And two years later, they invited G.B. Cashwell, who had been at the Azusa Street Mission, to come and to preach. On January 12, 1908, as he was preaching at the North Cleveland Church of God, Pastor Tomlinson got up from his seat to seek his personal spirit baptism. Like Seymour, he had been preaching it even though he did not yet have the experience. The presence of the Lord was so great that he didn't make it to the altar that morning. Rather, he fell to the floor, and lying on the floor, he had a vision in which the Lord took him around the world preaching the gospel. That moment transformed his life and transformed the Church of God movement. Today, we're in 191 countries and nations of the world and committed to partner with others to finish their Great Commission. Thank the Lord for what he's done. So we're here tonight to celebrate. We're here tonight to celebrate our history. We're here tonight to celebrate what God is continuing to do. And we're here tonight to celebrate someone. We're here to celebrate Dr. Harold Bear, along with his wife, Dr. Layla Bear. So we're going to hear a lecture. Sing first, right, Jonathan? And uh, we're going to uh, then honor the bears. So we dedicate our singing. We dedicate our speech, our gifts to the glory of God and what God is doing among us. So uh, we're told that at the Azusa Street Mission, at almost every service, they sang, The Comforter Has Come. Now, we don't do that very often anymore, but I think it's worth our repeating the experience. So thank you, uh, Jonathan Sawyer, for being with us today. The words are on the back of your program. Should they stand? All right. You can't sing sitting down. Stand with us as Jonathan leads us in The Comforter Has Come, as well as some other worship choruses. tidings round wherever man is found wherever human hearts and human woes abound let every Christian tongue proclaim the joyful sound the comforter has come give oh spread the tidings round wherever man is found the comforter has come lo the great king of kings with healing in his wings to every captive soul a full spring and through the vacant cells the song of triumph brings the comforter has come the comforter is come the comforter is come the holy ghost from heaven the father's promise give spread the tidings round wherever man is found the comforter has come sing till the echoes fly above the vaulted sky and all the saints above to all below reply in strength 
of endless love. The song that ne'er will die. The comforter has come. The comforter is come. The comforter is come. The Holy Ghost from heaven. The Father's promise give. Oh, spread the tidings round wherever man is found. The comforter has come. Can we give the Lord praise in his house tonight? Sing, Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Omnipotent Father of mercy and grace, Thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place, Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place, Omnipotent Father of mercy and grace, Thou art welcome Sing that last line. Omnipotent Father of mercy and grace, Thou art welcome in this place. If you're able, would you just lift holy hands before the Lord tonight and welcome His sweet presence in this room. Hallelujah. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face and I know they feel the presence of the Lord lift your voice sing sweet Holy Spirit sweet heavenly One more time. Oh, sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us, filling us with your love. And for these blessings, Without a doubt, we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place. And the church said, Amen. 
Amen. You may be seated. Tonight, Danny Bear is here to honor his father, Dr. Harold Bear. Would you please make him welcome tonight as he comes to sing?
Thank you, Jonathan and Danny. Uh, we're grateful that you're with us tonight. What a great testimony of the Lord being broken and spilled out for us. And I hope it's our testimony that we're willing to be broken and spilled out for him. If you saw our early announcements, uh, you know that we noted that Dr. Daniel Woods would be our speaker tonight. Regrettably, he was hospitalized this past weekend and is unable to be with us. Uh, he let me know this afternoon that he had made it home and uh, has to have a period of uh, recuperation but is at home and doing well. And so I know he would appreciate your prayers as you think of him in the coming uh, hours and days. But <laughs> we live in a town with a lot of treasure and a lot of people who uh, know how to do what God has called them to do. And many great scholars at the university and at Pentecostal Theological Seminary. And so I'm pleased tonight that Dr. Dell M. Coulter has agreed uh, to be our speaker. Thank you, Dell. Uh, I deeply appreciate your willingness to do this and uh, with such short notice, but I know this is a topic that you've been thinking about and working on for quite some time, and, and we, as far as I know, we get to be the first people to uh, hear what it is that, uh, that, that you've been uh, researching and learning. Dale is a native of Florida, if anybody uh, here uh, is from Florida. He uh, earned a Bachelor of Arts degree right here at the university. Uh, went on to Reform Theological Seminary for his Master of Divinity, and then to Oxford University, some of us have heard of that in England, uh, for his uh, Doctor of Philosophy. He's actually a medievalist by training, which means most of us don't know how to talk to him. Uh, but he has, over the years, spent a lot of time researching and writing and teaching about the holiness and Pentecostal movements. Dr. Coulter is a professor of historical theology at Pentecostal Theological Seminary. Prior to coming to PTS, he taught for eight years here at Lee and then 13 years at Regent University in Virginia Beach. Both Lee and Regent awarded Dr. Coulter their Excellence in Scholarship Award, both universities. He has uh, written a number of books, the most recent of which is the Holy Spirit in Higher Education, Renewing the Christian University. And I saw today that a week from tonight, I think, you're giving a lecture from that book, so uh, here on the Lee campus. So we'll look forward to hearing that as well. He's published extensively in print and online publications. He served as president of the Society for Pentecostal Studies and editor of their journal, uh, NUMA, the Journal of the Society for Pentecostal Studies. 
and he's currently on the editorial board of Firebrand Magazine. If you don't know Firebrand, take a look. It's an online periodical about what God is doing in the Wesleyan Methodist movement uh, today. Take a look at it. Dr. Coulter is an ordained minister, uh, bishop in the Church of God. He's married to Esther, who teaches at East Hamilton High School in Chattanooga. And they have three children, Bella, Sophia, and David. So would you please give a warm welcome to Dr. Dale Coulter as he presents Sanctified Sound, the development of blues, jazz, and gospel within the sanctified churches. Get this a little higher for me. Um, it is a privilege for me to be here um, for numerous reasons. Uh, number one, um, I'm just grateful to be in the room where Dr. Harold Bear is going to be honored. Um, and I'm grateful to be here with Dr. Layla Bear as well. Um, you know, Harold, he just, the Lord just keeps using him in such wonderful ways. Um, he, he's going to share some things with you later, and I'm not going to steal his or David's thunder, but it, it's an honor to get calls from him occasionally to hear what God's doing through him, through Layla, and the, the ministry that they have pouring into the lives of pastors who sometimes feel forgotten. And uh, I told Harold, you are an elder statesman in the church, and I'm so grateful for you and the ministry that you're continuing to do um, uh, for the church and for the kingdom. I'm also grateful that I get to work in a wonderful place, Pentecostal Theological Seminary, and I'm grateful I get to work for wonderful people, Dr. Mike Baker, my leader, who I'm grateful for. Um, uh, it is just a wonderful thing to work for him. He's a great president that we have. So I don't have a musical bone in my body, but I want to talk about music tonight. And I, I, I'm looking out at people who have lots of musical bones, so uh, I'll have to apologize for that. But I do want to talk about what's going on in uh, African-American Pentecostalism in particular, um, hence the name Sanctified Churches. And I want us to think about what's going on in 1920, 30, and 19, well, up to 1940. Um, I'm starting to work with this idea that there was a common soundscape in early Pentecostalism. I came across a uh, 1915 Chattanooga uh, reporter who attended the Church of God General Assembly in 1915, and the music he heard, he called it ragtime, which I thought was very interesting that the Church of God in 1915 had music that sounded like Scott Joplin and ragtime. Um, so there must have been some common soundscape um, I'm going to talk about the soundscape in the Church of God in Christ. So let me begin. And I may get, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I am Pentecostal to the core, I'll tell you that. So I may get a little happy, I don't know. Zora Neale Hurston once observed that the sanctified churches represented a form of protest against the highbrow tendency in the black church. She centered this protest in shouting, dancing, and song making. It was against forms of worship that failed to convey the distinctive Africanisms of slave religion and could no longer contain the new wine of Pentecost. For this reason, Hurston um, saw the music of the sanctified churches as involving a revitalizing element in black religion. While Hurston did not fully articulate the contours of this revitalizing element, one glimpses it in statements by Mahalia Jackson, the gospel singer, or Louis Armstrong, the jazz um, uh, trumpetist, or B.B. King, or Dizzy Gillespie, all of whom refer to their experiences in sanctified churches as grounding their musical careers. Hurston's friend, Langston Hughes, probably summarized this experience best when he recalled as a teenager entering a Pentecostal church. The impression was so deep that Hughes later mused that no experience in church had impacted him as much. He states, I was entranced by their stepped up rhythms, tambourines, hand clapping and uninhibited dynamics rivaled only by Ma Rainey singing the blues at the old monogram theater. It was the combination of the dramatic and the musicality of the sanctified churches that generated a deep love for black gospel later in his life. 
Like James Baldwin before him, Hughes tried to capture it in the 1958 play turned novel, Tambourines to Glory, and the play The Gospel Glow. Billed as a black passion play, Hughes premiered The Gospel Glow on October 26, 1962 at Washington Temple Church of God in Christ in Brooklyn. The songbird of the East, Madame Ernestine B. Washington, took the lead vocals. Washington's mother had been a sanctified singer in the 1920s and 30s in the Church of God in Christ, while Washington herself began recording in the 1940s. This cloud of witnesses speaks to the crucial role that the sanctified churches played in the development of music in the early 20th century. Pentecostal musicians and singers contributed to early blues, jazz, and black gospel in a way that cultivated those forms and kept them going. Langston Hughes was not far from the truth when he said that the worship of the sanctified churches rivaled Ma Rainey's show at the Monogram Theater. These early Pentecostals brought the juke joint into the church house and integrated it into the worship. No musical instrument was off limits in the sacred space of worship as the saints shouted, danced, and sang their way through to victory. Ministers and musicians utilized the emerging networks within holiness and Pentecostal circles to ply their craft leading to hot spots of sanctified music like Chicago, Dallas-Fort Worth, and Harlem. What one finds in the development of sanctified music is a merging of the sacred and the secular under the spiritual canopy of Pentecost with its invitation to the earthy. When James Cone wrote his interpretation of the spirituals and the blues as two sides of black experience, the blues expressed the more embodied and therefore secular form. But this is not the case with the sanctified churches manifesting itself in a theological commitment to dance and improvisational singing the embodied worship of sanctified churches offered fertile soil for more visceral and reflexive forms of music so tonight what i want to do is explore the development of this music among the sanctified churches between 1910 and 1940. i want to probe their sources just a little bit and reflect on their importance in the dialogue with cone's work on the blues the musical creativity in these churches came from the ethos of the holiness and Pentecostal circles that allowed for the full participation and integration of African-American slave religion with its ring shout, its ecstatic prayers, and its dancing in a way that black Baptist and Methodist churches just didn't. It was in this context that Pentecostal musicians like Arizona Drains could break out and others, such as Sister Rosetta Tharp, were formed. The sanctified church saw these musical forms as intrinsic to black identity and black life. Moreover, Cone's desire to see the spirituals and the blues as two sides of the same black experience finds its fulfillment in these musical forms. The power of the spirit radiated through ebony-toned bodies in the church service, akin to the dancing and music one found in venues like the Cotton Club or the Monogram Theater. In terms of forms of musicality and dance, there was no break between the sacred and the secular. Cone's quest to reconcile the blues and the spirituals finds its fulfillment in this sanctified music. So to make this argument tonight, I want to do four things. The first thing I want to do is examine the spirituality of the founder of the Church of God in Christ, Charles Harrison Mason, because I think that spirituality created theological space for new musical forms. <clears throat> As the founder of the network of the largest form of African-American Pentecostalism, Mason's theology set the tone for many musicians in the Church of God in Christ. I then want to turn and explore Pentecostalism in Chicago and think about the lines of connection between Chicago and Pentecostalism elsewhere. The third section explores the contribution to music made in these early Pentecostal churches, particularly in Chicago, in the 20s and the 30s. And then I want to conclude with an engagement with Cone's work on the spirituals and the blues to really show how sanctified music overcomes the tensions between the juke joint and the church, or the blues and the spirituals. You see, Pentecostals brought secular forms into the church and sanctified them through their music. Section number one, the spirit takes control, Charles Harrison Mason and the new thing. When Charles Harrison Mason returned to Memphis in May 1907 from his spiritual encounter at Azusa Street, he set the tone for the fusion of slave religion and Pentecostal spirituality that became so central to the identity of the fledgling Church of God in Christ denomination. Reflecting back on his experience of baptism in the spirit, Mason noted, quote, I was full of the power when I reached home. The spirit had taken full control of me and everything was new to me. 
and to all the saints. The way he did things was all new. He taught me how and what to sing, and all his songs were new. Mason interpreted this newness as a move to greater spontaneity and improvisation in worship. Seven months later, he reported back to Seymour that although the fight had been intense in Memphis, quote, the Lord is casting out devils, healing the sick, and singing the sweetest songs. He, the Lord, that is, has sung hundreds of songs. I do not have the time to go back over one to practice it, for the next one will be new. Mason was moving toward the creative use of choruses as part of the worship. He believed that the Spirit was singing in him and through him, much like the singing in tongues had occurred at Azusa Street. The transcripts of the depositions in the 1908 trial between Mason and Charles Price Jones over the denomination reveal that Mason had minimized hymn books at that point. After being asked whether he used hymnals, Mason responded, I just sing like the scriptures say. From the beginning, Mason thought that Pentecost at Azusa required something new in spirituality. The spirit was doing something new, and this required a new soundscape that reflected the freedom and the spontaneity of Pentecostal worship. The 1911 convocation, Holy Convocation for the Church of God in Christ in Lexington, Mississippi, offers a glimpse into Mason's new approach to worship. Throughout the services, Mason and other ministers move seamlessly between preaching and singing. At one point, E.B. Williams reports that, quote, Elder C.H. Mason sang a new song in the wonderful way in which the Holy Ghost uses him. Oh, what a wonder. Oh, what a wonder. Jesus, my Savior, is working in his own. Much of the time, this improvisational singing functioned like a blues riff or a lick in the context of the service. The riff involved the repetition of or allusion to a biblical phrase. In one service, the local pastor, Jeff Lewis, spontaneously burst out after his sermon, Hear ye the word of the Lord, oh hear ye the word of the Lord. Stemming from the book of Jeremiah, the phrase became a spontaneous singing in the spirit. In other instances, one finds allusions to biblical texts such as, when they say, the Lord began to sing in the Holy Ghost, Jesus, my Savior, there's wisdom in him, glory and honor to the Lamb. The allusion to Revelation also echoes calls to hear and repent that one finds in that same book. The singing in the spirit that Williams reports turns out to be improvisational riffs in the context of worship that involve the entire congregation and move the service forward. This new soundscape Mason introduced led to other developments in worship. The spontaneity in word and song had its counter in dancing. Starting in 1923, the Church of God in Christ published an annual yearbook that functioned like a book of minutes. The 1926 yearbook has an excerpt on dancing from Mason as a part of a section on doctrinal subjects. Imagine that, putting a sermon on dancing in the middle of doctrine. Placing his thoughts on dance in this doctrinal section speaks to the importance that Mason saw it as part of this new liturgy he wanted to develop. He describes dance as, quote, a parable of heavenly joy that expresses victory in God. Dancing involves the bubbling up of joy from the spirit as the saint moves in the glory of God. The person, quote, dances in Christ and about him, for he is all. In the same section, Mason discusses the role of tongues, arguing that tongue speech requires cooperation between the spirit and the believer. As the believer yields to the spirit's utterance, the two flow together and create a unity in which Christ is all. In the same way, dancing is symbolic of joy and victory as the intense action of bodily movement unites Christ to the believer so that Christ is all. Dancing and tongue speech are two liturgical actions in the context of worship that fuse the congregation with the presence of Christ. As Mason declared in one convocation, quote, a searching comforter is in the church filling whomsoever he wills. No man is able to teach a man but Jesus in the Holy Ghost. God is giving a duty of service. If you walk in it, you will do what he says. I want to see the people of God worship God. The sanctified blues player, Blind Willie Johnson, a Church of God in Christ member, caught Mason's vision and took his blues sound to Church of God in Christ congregations around Texas, singing songs like, Oh, the rain, the latter rain, the latter rain done fell on me. That act of worship was a sacramental expression of the Spirit's making Christ present 
in and through human bodies. For Mason, this is how worship embodied holiness and became the liturgical counterpart to a holy lifestyle. Music, singing, preaching, dancing, shouting, other forms of worship unfolded as individuals gave way to the Spirit's utterance in the act of worship. Individuals became a holy temple by consecrating themselves. In Mason's mind, the newness of the Spirit meant that the entire person, body and soul, became an instrument of worship in every way so that Christ is all. Mason's improvisational approach to worship as an expression of embodied holiness then created the space within which new musical forms could flourish. Second section, sobs, shouts, and miracles. Early Pentecostalism in Chicago. <clears throat> Pentecostalism burst onto the scene between April and December of 1906, primarily through the revival led by William Seymour at the Azusa Street Mission in Los Angeles. During its first two years, numerous individuals made the journey, as Mason did, to the mission to receive baptism in the spirit and then return to their own communities. At the same time that that was happening in Los Angeles, Charles Parham was moving north and south along the Mississippi River in the Midwest. By September 1906, Parham was in John Alexander Dowie's Zion City, just north of Chicago. He preached there for almost a month, which led a number of of Dowie's followers to embrace Pentecostalism. Parham's ministry brought a second wave of Pentecostal believers to the Windy City. By the fall of 1907, Chicago was becoming a hotbed for Pentecostalism, thanks in large part to two important early congregations, the Stone Church and the North Avenue Mission. With its message of racial unity, Pentecostalism spread quickly among different ethnic groups. By 1919, the Works Project Administration reported that in Chicago, there were 20 holiness or sanctified churches. The story of black Pentecostalism in Chicago begins with the Stone Church. After being ousted by Wilbur Valiva, um, the new general overseer of John Alexander Dowie's Catholic Christian Apostolic Church, William Piper started a new congregation. Piper noted that the church began with around 150 individuals, but what he didn't mention was that most of them had come from Dying, from Dowie's Chicago City, or sorry, Chicago Church, Zion Tabernacle. Parham's preaching in Zion City had caused a rift among many of Dowie's followers. After agonizing over whether to embrace the Pentecostal message, Piper decided it was genuine and invited the Reverend F.A. Graves, Jeannie Campbell, and Marie Burgess to fill his pulpit in June of 1907. All three of those speakers came out of Parham's ministry among Dowie's followers. A revival immediately burst out with many people speaking in tongues, including Piper's 10-year-old daughter, Irene. One local paper blasted out the headline under the picture of William and Lydia Piper, Queer Sex Claims Gifts of Languages. The revival lasted through September with F.F. F. Bosworth, the young band leader and cornet player from Zion City, joining them. Stone Church had become thoroughly Pentecostal by the end of 1907 and boasted a regular attendance of over 300. Located at 37th in Indiana, the church was just a few blocks from the southern border of Bronzeville, that neighborhood in Chicago, which was the flourishing of African-American life. It remained in this location at least through 1915, with Piper's wife, Lydia, leading the church after his death in 1911. Standing at that border between black and white life in Chicago, the church, the church quickly became an important center of early Pentecostalism, with men and women filling its pulpit and many ethnic groups represented in its services. In 1913, the evangelist Maria Woodworth Etter led a revival there that lasted for a year. The Chicago Tribune described the scene on a hot July night. Three girls fainted last night. Women went into hysterics and cried and wrung their hands. Men sobbed and shouted and shook their clenched fists at the ceiling. The reporter seemed almost in shock at the race and gender mixing that he observed as Woodworth Etter prayed for people and a blind woman testified to receiving her sight. One of the African-American women present was Elder Lucy Smith, who went on to found All Nations Pentecostal Church in 1918. We'll talk about her in a minute. At least some of the early African-American Pentecostal churches in Chicago came from individuals 
associated with the Stone Church. While the African-American paper, the Chicago Defender, placed the opening date of the Great Migration of African-Americans North on May 17, 1917, the fact is a steady stream had been pouring into the city for at least a decade. Robert Maravich notes that between 1910 and 1920, Chicago's black population went from just over 44,000 to about 110,000 to make Chicago the fourth largest city for African-Americans. And more than 80% of African-American Chicagoans in 1920 were from the South. In the 20% from the North was one person, Mother Bishop Mattie L. Thornton Branch. She had moved from New York to Chicago to plant a small Pentecostal congregation in 1908 that later became the headquarters for the Holy Nazarene Tabernacle Church of the Apostolic Faith. That's a title. Thornton is credited with being the first black Pentecostal pastor in Chicago, but she had a unique combination of Hebrewism and Pentecostalism, and that minimized her impact on music among Chicago Pentecostals. The seeds of revival, though, grew quickly among African-American Pentecostals. In 1922, the very year that Louis Armstrong first set foot on Chicago streets, George Brinkman reported that there were five tent meetings happening within a 16-block radius in Bronzeville. Having come out of the holiness movement, Brinkman had been publishing the Pentecostal Herald in Chicago and reporting on the Pentecostal scene since 1915. What he saw happening in the summer of 1922 thrilled him. He lauded the success of these tent meetings, going so far as to say that African-American Pentecostals are not afraid of a little noise or manifestation, as are some of our white folks. Consequently, the Spirit of God has a better chance to work. Two of the meetings were led by Elder Lucy Smith and Elder William Roberts, who was planting a Church of God in Christ congregation. Both churches they founded went on to become prominent in the landscape of Chicago Pentecostalism. Brinkman's reporting shows how some of the early forms of Pentecostal, Pentecostalism were networking with one another regardless of the ethnic composition of the congregation. The tent meetings in 1922 marked the onset of an aggressive period of mission for African American Pentecostals in Chicago. The Works Project Administration reported that by 1928, the number of sanctified churches had grown from 20 to 56, which comprised about 19% of all black church members in Chicago. During the same decade that blues, jazz, and gospel were emerging as distinct forms in the cabarets and clubs between 31st and 35th on State Street in Bronzeville, Pentecostal churches were growing and changing the landscape of Christianity. With this growth came a fusion of the sacred and the secular of music as early Pentecostals brought horns, guitars, tambourines, pianos, and other instruments into the worship context. Section three, playing before the Lord, the musical contribution of African-American Pentecostalism. Between 1915 and 1925 in Chicago, the distance between the sanctified churches and the older established black Methodist and Baptist churches seemed almost insurmountable. According to Wallace Best, before 1915, established black Chicago churches placed great emphasis on preaching that was orderly and worship that was decorous. The distance was exacerbated by the race riots in 1919 and the bombings of 59 buildings inhabited by African Americans between 1917 and 1921. Established black Chicagoans wanted those southern newcomers to act more like them in order to keep the peace. Older congregations like Quinn Chapel AME, Walters AME, Olivet Baptist, Pilgrim Baptist, and Ebenezer Baptist boasted a black bourgeois membership of thousands. They hired conservatory trained music directors to direct choirs and hold concerts in which, Afri uh, in which slave spirituals were rearranged into more classical compositions. When Thomas Dorsey, the founder of Black Gospel, arrived in Chicago in 1920, he joined Pilgrim Baptist Church. One of the most prominent choir directors was Professor J. Wesley Jones in his radio choir at Metropolitan Community Church, which was an independent church formed out of Bethel AME. He put together classical arrangements for the choir to sing. 
Robert Maravich has described Jones as the epitome of a more classically produced and refined music. The preaching that accompanied this music was to be erudite. It was to be deliberative so as to convince the intellect. Within these congregations, European styles of music and preaching were the order of the day, although they fueled the political activism as part of, a shim, uh, of attempting to shape the culture of the black bourgeoisie. The sanctified churches represented almost the exact opposite of those black Baptist and Methodist churches, largely consisting of Southern transplants working in the factories, they reveled in spontaneity and freedom. The faster the pace of the music and the sermon, the better the spiritual experience. Preaching was a passion-filled explosion of repeated phrases, glory, hallelujah, amen, come on, that functioned as a kind of layering within a story that was told. All of that unfolded in a call and response atmosphere, re resulting in a kind of corporate dance between the preacher and the people. The songs were largely taken out of holiness hymnals, but they gave them new arrangements for different instruments. This is because the broader holiness Pentecostal movements remained part of a common network with, with persons moving in and out of them. They were transmitting holiness theology in new musical inner idioms. Beginning with Arizona Drains recording in 1926, Companies like Paramount Records, Victor Records, OK Records, and Vocalon Records began to issue what were called race records. These were those marketed specifically to the African-American community. According to Michael Corcoroson, <clears throat> Drains gave gospel its rhythmic identity with her barrel house piano style. Drains' career has been well documented by men like Timothy Dodge. Blind from birth, she attended the Institute for the Deaf, Dumb, and Blind Youths in Northwest Austin, Texas from 1896 to 1912. But by the early 1920s, she was in Dallas-Fort Worth playing for piano for the Reverend Samuel Crouch, the great uncle of Andre Crouch, who recommended her to Richard Jones of OK Records. Jones had already been recording Louis Armstrong and his Hot Five. Drains made the journey by train to Chicago to make the recordings. She had already been touring around with, uh, with Samuel Crouch and she had been playing and leading worship for his radio ministry. And it was out of that that she went to Chicago and between 1926 and 1929 recorded numerous songs. The first recording in 1926 had six songs that featured her unique style of piano playing which fused ragtime and barrel house in a fast pace to drive the song forward. Drains' barrel house style would, influence in, would end up influencing many other musicians, even a young Jerry Lee Lewis. Drains had also toured with elder, later Bishop, Ford Washington McGee in Oklahoma, and it was probably partly from her influence that McGee came to Chicago himself in 1925. He started holding tent, me tent meetings and brought lively music with him. He backed up Drains in her 1926 recording and then he made his own recordings with OK Records in Chicago in May of 1927. In fact, Arizona Drains is probably the pianist in the background, but it's not, we're not sure if that's the case. McGee recorded songs like Lion of the Tribe of Judy and Judah and Jesus the Lord is a Savior. While these songs were not released initially, McGee re-recorded them for Victor Records in 1929. One of the songs McGee recorded was 50 Miles of Elbow Room. It was a rearranged version of the Nazarene minister and composer Frederick Martin Lehman's hymn, Elbow Room. Maria Woodworth Etter was known to sing this song frequently during her meetings as she walked across the platform, waving a handkerchief and raising her hands in the air. You can, if you listen to it, and that's the problem when you only got two days to prepare, you can't play any music. <laughs> but if, if I could play it, you would hear the jazz horns in the background as McGee sings to the overcrowded residents of Bronzeville. Don't worry, there's plenty of elbow room in heaven. McGee helped a young Rosetta Tharp when he had tent meetings in Chicago. Tharp moved to Chicago when she was six years old in 1921. 
she and her mother started to attend what would become Roberts Temple Church of God in Christ under the elder William Roberts. It's the same place where Emmett Till's funeral was performed because his family was from that church. Um, elder William Roberts allowed guitars, tambourines, drums, and brass horns into the worship service. One member would later recall a common saying among the people, rock, church, rock. Tharp developed her skills at playing the guitar in the 1920s as she sang in Robert's Temple and helped F.W. McGee in his tent meetings. By the late 1920s, she was touring with her mother and eventually made her way to Harlem in the 1930s where she sang in the local Church of God in Christ on Sundays and then performed before a white audience at the Cotton Club during the week. Tharp's distinctive guitar sound, which you can hear, there's, they've done a lot, you can get on YouTube and hear this, influenced another young Pentecostal by the name of Elvis Presley in Memphis. She became known later as the godmother of rock and roll. These Church of God in Christ evangelists and ministers were bringing Southern style worship from the Mississippi Delta into Chicago and mixing it with the emerging jazz scene. Every year around Thanksgiving in Memphis, Charles Mason held a holy convocation that lasted three weeks, attracting usually at least 5,000 persons to it throughout the 1920s. During one year, a field unit from Victor Records recorded between 1928 and 1930 the Reverend E.S. Shy Moore and the elder Richard Bryant preaching as they were backed by the Memphis Sanctified Singers and the Holy Ghost Sanctified Singers. The, the piano, guitar, and the jug from the juke joint formed a tight sound for the choir to fill out Moore's preaching. What you glimpse in this recording is how southern sounds in Memphis were already fusing together various musical forms and instruments normally played in secular settings but brought into the holy convocation that Mason led. Mason would go down to Beale Street and perform baptisms right there at the edge of Beale Street, which is of course the famous street in Memphis where uh, William C. Handy and the blues took root. It was Mason's way of trying to preserve black identity by allowing for the, this creative adaptation of music in the new century. Church of God and Christ ministers were not the only Pentecostals creatively using this new music. Elder Lucy Smith, whom I mentioned before, was doing much the same at her independent All Nations Pentecostal Church. She had arrived in Chicago in 1910 when she stumbled into the Stone Church and became Pentecostal. By 1918, she was holding tent meetings and establishing a new congregation that took off in the 1920s. In an interview with Herbert Smith in 1935, she said this, this is not a black church, but a church for all nations. We have all kinds of people who come here regularly, Swedes, Polish, Italians, just plain white folks, and Jews. Everybody is welcome. The church was interracial, but poor and working class blacks were in the majority. Smith first broadcast a radio program called The Glorious Church of the Air on WIND-AM in 1933. Reviews of her methods and her music in the church were mixed. On the one hand, in 1934, one reporter, Louis A. Delaney, wrote in the Chicago Defender that the solo, I don't know what I do without my Lord, was a perfect number for some of the fan dancers or any cabaret. Charles Bowen went even further. After noting the fact that the program opened with the church's band, followed by a long prayer by Smith, Bowen went on to say that her speech was, quote, a disgrace to the radio broadcasting industry, as well as a slur upon our race. On the other hand, in 1938, James Gentry wrote of his own experience in the church for the Chicago Defender. Gentry was the one who coined the term Bronzeville to describe that, that neighborhood that was alive with black life. He stated this as he was in the church while sitting there, to my eyes, the beauty and gorgeousness of the scene grew most fitting and holy. With the sweet incense floating to me from the altar, I seemed to breathe in a subtle, 
subduing spirit. And to that beautiful music, my heart hushed itself in my breast. My very pulses grew still, and my brain swam in a new, half sinuous, half spiritual emotion. For a moment or two, I believed I understood the faith of the Pentecostal. For a moment, I seemed to taste the same ecstasy of the mystic that the elder did and felt as never before in wonder and in fear all the mystery and power of the church. Mother Smith, for the first time in my life, gave me a picture of Christianity that I never knew existed, a religion which reveled in ideas of beauty and grace. Smith's 60th birthday was celebrated in 1935 with more than a thousand members of both races attending the service at her church. The Chicago Defender noted that Miss Mar Sarah Martin sang a solo, My Record Will Be There, with Professor Thomas A. Dorsey at the piano. With Smith's church, the story has now come full circle. Thomas A. Dorsey, or Tommy Dorsey, is there giving honor as the founder of Black Gospel Sound in that Pentecostal church, because it was Tommy A. Dorsey that first gave Mahalia Jackson her start in Chicago, and it was Tommy Dorsey who was now at the piano before Elder Lucy Smith honoring her and recognizing the musical contribution that she had given. Last section, my soul is a witness, fusing the jute joint and the church. In the final section here, I just want to tease out some implications of this Pentecostal vision of Christianity that gave rise to the blues, jazz, and black gospel. I'm going to do this in dialogue with James Cone and his work, The Spirituals and the Blues. His argument in that work is how the spirituals and the blues shape black identity and black life because it, it helps to be an expression of black experience. But in examining that work, I think we can bring out some of the distinctives in the Pentecostal vision over against what was happening in Baptist and Methodist churches. You see, in that work, Cone intentionally tries to overcome a tendency to bifurcate the slave spirituals and the blues by prosecuting this case that black music is a living reality rooted in black experience. From the vantage point of black experience, the blues and spirituals stem from the quest to understand and articulate the burdens and hopes of black life in the United States. Their rootedness in black life led Cone to define the blues as secular spirituals. He says this, they're secular in the sense that they confine their attention solely to the immediate and affirm the bodily expression of the black soul, including its sexual manifestations. Now he's thinking about what's going down in the juke joint when he writes that. They are spirituals because they are impelled by the same search for the truth of black experience. While asserting a fundamental difference, Cone grounded the connection between the spirituals and the blues in terms of their expression of the concrete experience of black life. Truth in this sense, in, in the sense of the truth of the black experience, concerns the empirical realities that African Americans faced. The attempt to grapple with those realities and the expression of this struggle through black music. On the one hand, Cone unified the blues and the spirituals in black experience. On the other hand, he separated them into sacred and secular experiences of black life on the basis of their form, their content, and their historical location. In terms of historical location, the spirituals were slave songs created in antebellum America. The blues, however, emerged in the postbellum reality of Jim Crow. But there's a secondary location here. The spirituals functioned in the church. The blues seemed to operate in the juke joint. This spatial separation reveals the secularity of the form and context of the blues. The blues for Cone are this worldly in the sense that they attend to the immediate and the bodily. By immediate, Cone means the daily realities that African Americans face, their immediate struggle and their response to those realities in suffering, in struggling against them, and in their resistance to them. The bodily has to do with dance and sex as a kind of joyous celebration. Again, he's thinking about what's going down in the juke joint. Um, as a kind of joyous celebration in which the body becomes sacred. 
In defining the bodily that way, Cohn tries to overcome the division between sacred and secular, yet he also sees the juke joint as the primary location for this. The blues are secular, not simply because they speak of sex and love and struggle, the content of the blues, but also because of the way they give rise to and express dancing, hugging, and kissing, the form, in the midst of the celebration of the post-bellum juke joint, the location. The early Pentecostal contribution to jazz and blues challenges, in my view, Cone's definition of secular at all levels, the location, the form, and the content. First, Pentecostals see the daily realities and struggles of life in their immediacy as suffused with the power and presence of the Spirit. The focus on Pentecost and encounter meant that heaven was not otherworldly for Pentecostals. Salvation was not a, primarily an escape to heaven. Salvation was heaven come down right now in the midst of the people. It was the turning of the body into the temple of the living God. That's the new thing spirit baptism did. It made you a temple and your voice a sound of the spirit. In the moment of surrender to the spirit, the struggle with life gave way to the power of another world as the saint was transported into the presence of God. The way in which the spirit broke into the present through the bodily, whether in divine healing, whether in the ecstatic utterance of tongues, or the spontaneous jumping, shouting, dancing, all of that reinforced the this-worldly nature of salvation. We are experiencing the kingdom now in the electrifying atmosphere of the power and presence of God. Music was the sanctified sound the spontaneous and improvisational tongues that flowed from voices and hands surrender to the power of God. The second challenge in the midst of this conversation is the bodily. Cone talks about the, the embodied nature of the blues. But see, in the sanctified church, there was a fusion of this juke joint in the church through the celebration of life. In the sanctified church, the life was celebrated through dancing in the way in which Charles Mason said it. Dancing was a parable of joy. You dance under the power as an expression of the joy of God in the midst of the struggle of life. Speaking of a jazz pianist in Jacksonville in the 1930s, Zora Neale Hurston observed, seems like much of his business as much comes from playing for the sanctified churches as for parties. Standing outside the church and listening to that music coming from the church I can't tell just what kind of engagement he's in. In other words, he's playing the same kind of music that I find out there being played in the world. He's just playing it in the church um, for the people of God. Hurston's later reflections of a revolution in music among the sanctified churches stems from these observations in which the musical form was indistinguishable, thereby blurring the distinction between sacred and secular spaces. The African-American scholar Lawrence Levine surveyed some of these ob observations about sanctified churches, and he tried to argue for a growing tension between the sacred and the secular, out of which black gospel developed. But it becomes clear when you read Levine's analysis that the tension is really in black Baptist and Methodist churches. That tension evaporates in the glow of the glory of God in the midst of the sanctified worship experience. Tommy A. Dorsey would draw on that experience, that musicality of the sanctified churches, to create what became a new soundscape, the soundscape of black gospel. The musical form of the blues, jazz, and gospel had found a home already in the sanctified churches because it reflected the fast pace of and total immersion in the worship experience. The ecstatic embrace with the spirit, as the, or the ecstatic embrace with Christ, as the spirit descends in the church had its counter in dancing music, call and response of the sanctified worship service. You see, the gospel for Pentecostals was not simply to be preached. The good news was to be experienced and embodied. That's what made the news good. When you felt God, when you tasted, when you touched, when you drank in the presence of God, when the sanctified and when God sanctified you and shaped your life so that every routine, every task, just like every note of music, bore witness to a glory that hovered at the edge of the conscious mind. 
as Arizona Drain shouted out from her piano, my soul is a witness for my Lord. Pentecostals saw no division between the music that they were creating here in the worship house and the music out there. They brought that musical form into the church. They gave it new life because there was no division between the sacred and the secular. Now I'm wrapping up. In conclusion, Blind Willie Johnson, Arizona Drains, F.W. McGee, E.S. Moore, Elder Lucy Smith, Rosetta Tharp, those are a few of the names that shaped music among the sanctified churches in the 1920s. Tommy Dorsey did not begin writing and arranging gospel songs until the 1930s. Moreover, jazz and blues were emerging during the 1920s from a fusion of musical genres. Men and women in the sanctified churches were part of a new creation of music during the jazz age. Leaders like Charles Mason saw these new musical forms as vehicles, not only to carry the Pentecostal message, but to reinforce black identity and black life at a time when it was under threat from Jim Crow. Southern Pentecostals carried that music with them to places like Chicago, where they borrowed from other genres. The fast sermons, the loud and raucous atmosphere of the revivals, the dancing, the falling out under the power of the spirit, all reinforced a movement toward ecstatic embrace that, Afri that African American preachers saw as the heart of what it meant to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. In this atmosphere, the ecstasy of spiritual encounter linked with the ecstasy of the music to allow black and brown bodies to sing and dance and shout their way to victory in the challenges of that new urban context of Chicago. They had brought the juke joint into the church house. They didn't surrender the dance, they sanctified the dance. They didn't surrender the music, they sanctified the music. And journalists like James Gentry, along with novelists like Langston Hughes, could taste the ecstasy of God when they entered that place. Amen. Thank you, Dale. I'll have to lower this. No short jokes. I hope that you'll join us for our reception in a few minutes and dialogue with Dale about this. I couldn't help but to think about two things. You know, there's always generational tension when it comes to music and worship. Anybody experience that? Yeah. Couldn't help but remember 1972, the year I became a teenager. There was a long-haired guy, I just blanked out on his full name, Norman, um, help me out, somebody, Larry Norman, who asked the question, why should the devil have all the good music? <laughs> and of course, he introduced to a whole new generation this idea of rock music being a genre in which the gospel could be preached. Just about a month ago, I listened to the Church of God superintendent over Eastern Europe talk about the revival that God is pouring out in those countries. And he said, they are creating new forms of music to express what God is doing in their lives. It's a very powerful testimony. Well, I need to take a moment and thank some people. Uh, thank you, Lee University, for the use of this facility, for your team who's helping us with media and everything. And uh, <clears throat> some others have donated to make this evening happen. And their names are listed in the program. I hope you'll take note of it. Uh, Bishop Raymond L. Culpepper in the Church of God Division of Care, Dr. David Ramirez in the Church of God Division of Education, Bishop T. Dwight Spivey in the Church of God Foundation, Bishop Tom Madden in the Church of God in North Georgia, Bishop T. Wayne Doherty in the Church of God in Tennessee, Bishop M. Thomas Propes in Church of God World Missions, Hubert C. Buey, Bishop Gary Lewis in his Covenant Ministry Team, Bishop Tony Stewart in his Covenant Ministry Team, 
Dr. Michael L. Baker and the Pentecostal Theological Seminary, thank you. Um, Bishop David H. Gosnell, the Church of God in South Georgia. Bishop Toby Morgan and the Church of God in Virginia. Dr. Mark L. Williams and North Cleveland Church of God. Bishop Louis Rodriguez and the Church of God East Central Hispanic Region. Bishop Steve Smith and the Church of God in New York and Christopher and Sarah Morey. All of these gave so that tonight we could hear from Dr. Coulter and honor Harold Bear. And we want to do that now. Uh, when we developed this lecture, we knew that this would be an opportunity to say among us, God didn't stop doing things at Azusa Street. He's still working among men and women here in our time. There's still characteristics of that revival among us, an emphasis on Pentecost, the sense of global mission and evangelism, the significance of a godly and humble pastor, a commitment to raising up gospel ministers. No doubt much of the success of that revival can be attributed to Pastor Seymour. Born to the parents, born to parents who had been slaves. Seymour preached the baptism in the Holy Spirit accompanied by the Bible evidence of speaking in tongues. And when the revival came, he established a mission and surrounded himself with a ministry team that was interracial and included both men and women. And he was known for his humility and he insisted that the fruit of the Spirit, especially love, was just as important as the gifts of the Spirit, including speaking in tongues. You want to talk about evidence of, of spirit baptism? Yes, there's tongues, but is there also love? So there's much that we can say about the pastor and his role in the work of the church. And so tonight, I want to honor a pastor. When I thought about tonight, I thought, that's what we want to do. We want to talk about pastors. We want to talk about ministerial health. And so we come now to honor you, Dr. Harold Bear. First and foremost, Harold Bear is a pastor. Following a five-year pastorate in Withfield, Virginia, he became lead pastor of Covenant Church of God in Charlottesville, where he served for 39 years. Now, his, he, he, he writes that his father's pastoral emphasis on missions had once led him to think maybe he should be a missionary. But that didn't come about. But what did result in that is that Covenant Church became a home for missionaries. He writes how that uh, while attending Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, he attended a transcultural church. He later wrote in an evangel article, our eyes were open to the beauty of people looking different and working together in the kingdom. And under the Bears' leadership, Covenant Church became a church that included worshipers from many nations and hosted, I understand, five different services for ethnic minorities. I've been told that visitors were a little bit surprised to walk in the door and see more than 75 flags representing countries of attendees, former attendees, missionaries that they were supporting. Although Covenant Church was one congregation serving one Lord, they recognized the value of people of other cultures, other nationalities, other languages, other ethnicities, other nationalities. We also have seen through the years how Harold Bear has been a leader in the Church of God and everywhere he is at, was at to improve the place where he was serving. Some of us recall motions at the General Assembly that he made, speeches that he made to try to better the church of God. He utilized his PhD research in sociology to help the church of God more fully understand ourselves and where we came from. If anybody wants to read that, we've got a copy at the 
Dixon Pentecostal Research Center you can take a look at. And he served as a member of the Board of Trustees for Pentecostal Theological Seminary for 27 years now, always trying to better where he is at. He's also a well-known communicator. Not only did he spend decades preaching on Sundays, but uh, he's consistently taken advantage of whatever avenue was available to encourage others. One of the first I knew to use blogs and email letters and routinely uses Facebook in order to encourage others. And he's an author of, more, of things that are longer than a Facebook post. They call me Pentecostal. A month of Sundays, colorful stories of God's presence and humor, and Hell is War, which he co-wrote with Dr. Layla Bear. Dr. Bear earned his PhD from the University of Virginia, and he is continually encouraging others to improve themselves and especially their education. I recently uh, lunched with him, and it didn't take but just a moment for him to strike up a conversation with a young woman who was serving us in a local restaurant, and he began to talk to her about her education and what she could do to better herself. If your best opportunity is the local community college, start there. But start. And if I can help you, here's my card. He's continually recruiting students for Lee University, for Pentecostal Theological Seminary, because he believes in the value of lifelong education. And tonight especially, I want to highlight his ministry of encouraging pastors. Having grown up in parsonages, the Bears developed a passion to care for pastors and their families. And they frequently opened the doors of Covenant Church for pastors needing respite. Although they're no longer pastoring a congregation, they haven't slowed down. And they're continually visiting and encouraging pastors, families, through their nonprofit, encouraging the saints. So, uh, I can't say Dr. Bear, Dr. Harold Bear and Dr. Layla Bear, would you join me here for a few minutes on our platform? So let me conclude by uh, simply saying thank you for your life of ministry in the local church, in our educational systems, and in today as you encourage pastors in many, many places. So, Brandon, if you'll join me here. Why don't we do this? Dr. Layla Bear, we, we know you're there all along, every step of the way. So Thank you. Uh, take those as a symbol of uh, our recognition of your faithfulness and uh, your partnership in ministry. And Dr. Harold Bear. <laughs> it's uh, with great pleasure that we present to you this evening uh, from the Dixon Pentecostal Research Center, our Spirit of Azusa Award. God bless you. Our photographer is trying to communicate with me. Okay. Uh, 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 I'm slow. And we'll take some formal pictures. Okay, I'd like for you to comment as you would like. Uh, do remember that we've got food waiting downstairs, and I'm sure everybody's looking forward to that. I'd like to say thank you very much. And when we were starting out pastoring, it was very hard, mainly financial, hard. But there was a man from Cleveland that had pastored North Cleveland Church of God that would stop by or call us occasionally. His name was Doyle Stanfield, and he encouraged us as young ministers. 
and it just meant so much in our lives. And then when we pastored Charlottesville, we went through a hard time, as all pastors do. But there are some of you here that my husband talked to on the phone, and you made such a difference in our lives. And I thank you for being there. You know who you are. And that just encouraged us, encouraged us to go and do it for others. We want to help pastors because we know what the life is like. It's a wonderful, beautiful life, but it has challenges. Thank you. Thank you. I will not be lengthy, but I do want to make a few comments. First of all, I want you to be mindful that there are people, even in other countries, who are watching, who are students at our seminary and part of Lee University, and they are participating tonight. One of them is Andrew Ball in Newfoundland, Canada. Uh, Dr. Coulter came to me one day and he said, uh, I don't know, I hear the go-to guy. We've got a student who needs some money uh, to uh, take a class. And so I said, give me his number. I don't know about the money. I called him. I liked him so much that we drove 7,000 miles by car, 320 miles on a ferry across the Atlantic and spent a week in Newfoundland and he's watching us here tonight along with others. Dr. Roebuck, thank you so much. An elderly saint once said to me, words are pictures, and there are no words that allow me to picture how to express appreciation here tonight. I want to share with you a few thoughts that will help you to better understand what we're doing and why I hope there'll be lots of people that will emulate the ministry we're doing. Keep in mind, I was baptized with the Holy Spirit on this campus. This is my roots. This is where I came from. This is who I am. While we're loyal to the Church of God, God has opened doors to us in the last few years, transdenominationally, Presbyterian, Charismatic, Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal Holiness, Assembly of God. God has been so gracious, even Mennonites. I've done seminars for Mennonite ministers. I want you to know that in 1973, we led a church in rural Virginia. We took time to go to North Carolina to visit my parents who were still being uh, pastors. They were, it was their last church. And when I drove up into the parking lot, my dad was on a little old lawnmower. He was not a big man, about five foot nine. He was a big man at heart, a pastor, and he was mowing the church lawn. I got up out of the car, walked over to him, and I said, Dad, what are you doing mowing the lawn? I asked him that question three times. The first time he said, son, the grass needs cutting. The second time he said, son, they pay me $15 a week extra. The third time he said, son, I'll always rest afterward. It broke my heart. I asked myself this question, God, why are there so many good men and women who are filled with the Holy Spirit who preach the gospel, who are loyal and faithful, but their churches do not grow. And for six months I was tortured. I consulted, I prayed, and one day the Lord whispered to me and said, they don't do better because they don't know how. Our church was doing very well by that time. After five years, we had bought a new home, best car we'd ever owned, piece of land. I was the highest paid lecturer in a local college. It, life was good. Two weeks later, we resigned, enrolled in doctoral studies. God said, go prepare yourself. We went back and earned doctorates to do what we're doing now. I want you to know that Covenant Church began helping us 29 years ago. Layla came to my office one day. I'm a very nomadic, restless soul. I don't like vacations. I think they're terrible and boring and I need something to do. So even on a vacation, I'm picking up a phone, calling a pastor, or going to visit somebody, taking somebody out to eat, getting up in the morning before Layla's ready to get out, meeting a pastor for breakfast, Methodist, Baptist, I don't care. Give me somebody to talk to about Jesus. And so what happened is she sat down in the office and she said, I'll make a deal with you if you will agree to take a vacation We'll go somewhere we've never been, and we will take some pastors and their families out to eat. We took a break. We flew to Minneapolis. 
we rented a car and we visited 35 pastors, took them out to eat and paid for their meal. And it was revolutionary. We've been doing that now for 25, 29 years. We leave without money sometimes or just, we go, we're leaving Saturday for about 20 days. We don't have enough money for 20 days. But you know what? I say to Layla, let's start. We get broke, we'll come home. And we've never had to come home short. So now we're going to be heading out Saturday on a tour to recruit for the seminary, recruit for Lee, but we'll be spending time with pastors and their families. We go to where they are. We don't even know them. I haven't even made phone calls yet. But I'll tomorrow, I will call and I'll find a pastor and say, we'll see you Saturday evening. Choose a restaurant. And then we spend time with them. And you know what happens? After about 30, 40 minutes, when they find out we're not with Amway, <laughs> the walls come down and they start sharing their problems and we're able to build friendships. And it's powerful. Now, you must know that one of the things that's important to me, I am four years and a few months out from a nine inch cut down my abdomen with pancreatic cancer and chemo that poisoned me and doctors had never seen anything like it. I won't describe it. And I was quarantined and they did not know what to do. They turned me over to God, sent me home and one doctor said, go do what Jesus wants you to do because we don't know what to do with you. And so I'm still free of cancer at this point, but I know what it's like to have a doctor look at me and say, I wouldn't worry about getting dental work right now. Meaning, I don't really think you're gonna live that long. I know what that's like. So every day to me is a miracle day. Every day I'm determined to call somebody and encourage them. When I look out into the faces of professors who taught me in 1960s, church leaders who've invested in me, my debt is greater than I can pay. Now listen to Dr. Coulter. And if I gather anything from the spirit of Azusa, it seems to me we ought to be going in the power of the spirit with joy. I think that's what it sizes up for me and settles down. So we try and bless others. I thought I would leave you with a story of the impact. I could tell you stories all night long. You want to call sometime? I'm full of stories of the results of what we're doing. We were in a remote area. I'll be careful to protect the person. We met a pastor and his wife who were pastoring about 40 people. And uh, we learned that both of them had spent a life in drugs until they were wasted and hopeless. The man spent about six and a half years in prison. In a rehab center, they met each other, fell in love, gave their hearts to Jesus, and got married. They're now Church of God pastors. Hallelujah. So his past, he's barely out of probation, even as a Church of God pastor. His opinion of himself is so small when I met him. I said, I want to see your church. I want to see the building, because I'm a builder's family. So I see things, lighting and other things that I can give clues. And so when I went to visit the church, and I'm almost through, but hear this. And I saw his attitude toward himself. I was so moved. And I said, tell me about your education. And he said, well, high school? No, not really. Not really. He said, well, I guess. He said, I actually didn't finish high school and I went to get my GED. And when I did, he said, they asked me some questions. And the man kept asking me questions. And he said, he just turned around and signed off my high school diploma. Didn't take any class, nothing. Well, I understand why. Because I looked in his office left and right and I said, are these your books? He said, yes. I said, have you read many of these books? He said, yes, most. Shelf full, shelf full. I said, pastor, I'm a scholar. You're an intelligent man. You're a scholar. And it was like, he was stunned. He was stunned. 
and I reached for him and put my arms around him and gave him his first father's hug in his life. And he's a member, he's now a student at our seminary, by the way. That's the power. When a pastor in Callis, Maine, that we met, is now connecting with Andrew Ball in Newfoundland in classes and with Curtis McDuffie in Eureka, Montana, and in Newport, Vermont, Vermont Larry, Wall. Larry Wall, 68 years of age. They're all students at the seminary, knocking it out, and I'm excited. <laughs> Thank you so much. Pray for us as we keep running for all we can do while we can do. God bless you. Thank you, thank you again. Let's get some pictures of things here. What a great story. No doubt there are others out there that God is raising up. One of the ministries that uh, the Lord has raised up in the Church of God is our Center for Ministerial Care. And we, there's a table out in the lobby if you're not aware of them. I hope you'll stop by uh, that table. And uh, that ministry is uh, under the uh, oversight of Dr. Tim Manis and Bishop Raymond F. Culpepper II. And I wanted to close tonight by giving them an opportunity to come and just briefly give us a synopsis of their ministry because the spiritual health of pastors and ministers is important to the life of the church. So I invite them to come and to share with you and then to pray a benediction and a blessing for our reception, which is downstairs in the John D. Nichols room. Come, gentlemen. Thank you, it's great opportunity to be here. Uh, I think I saw a few former uh, general overseers coming in here. I never thought I would be standing in this building. This building wasn't here when I was at Lee. Uh, and so it's, it's such an honor to be standing right here to be able to address you guys about this. And what a great lecture. Man, if you did that on two days preparation, that, that's awesome. That was awesome. That was intense. Uh, well, look, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about what we do, the Center for Ministerial Care. Um, and I think the best way for me to do it is to give you just a little brief story about my time at Lee. Uh, I won't be, be long. I know there's food downstairs. Uh, but I had a professor at Lee that made a huge impact on my life, as so many professors at Lee and at the seminary make on every person that goes through there that they train. Uh, but he told a great story about caregiving and about how he and his wife had traveled to a new place. He was in college. He was going to get a doctorate degree, and they tried out a few churches. And then a, a very tragic incident happened, and a member of his family was in the hospital. And so a number of pastors came through where he had been visiting, trying to get them to, you know, to minister to them. So the pastors would come in, they would talk to them, they would say a prayer, they would solemnly bow, and, and they would nod, and, and they would do what they can. None of them are bad pastors. It's a, that's, a tough, that's a tough landing to stick. But then one pastor comes in, and he stands there, and he just cries. And he hugs them, and he cries. And that was where they went to church. And that was caregiving. And that pastor, what the story doesn't always encompass, it's about how you provide the care. What it doesn't discuss is when that pastor walked outside that hospital and got in his car, he didn't stop thinking about that. A part of that left a trace. And pastors are first responders. And they care for people. They're there before anybody else gets there a lot of times. They're there way before anybody gets there sometimes. And I saw Dr. Mark Williams, and, and he and I shared a, a, a thing like that. But they're first responders. 
And as first responders, they need care. And that is what ministerial care does. It is the only ministry in the church of God that doesn't have an outreach or a plan. We have people, we have pastors, and that's what we focus on. We do that through a number of ways. Just quickly, we have counseling. We do counseling for uh, just regular uh, sort of pastoral counseling. If a pastor is having a struggle of some type, he can come. Uh, it is totally free for the pastor, for his family, for his children. And I forgive me if I'm spitting in this thing. I am not the polished Culpepper. He's somewhere else tonight. <laughs> but... Uh, but we have counseling for any church family, totally free. We do restoration work because when ministers uh, make mistakes, they lose their credentials, we don't give up on them. The work they do is too important, and those people are too valuable, and they can make a big impact. And so we have restoration. We do restoration. Uh, and then we have Pastoring on, on Purpose, which is a podcast. Uh, we don't think that it's only right for ministerial care to care when there's a problem. We want to put things out there that can be a resource. We want to put things out there that can help ministers. Uh, we talk about grief. We talk about systems. You talk about, you know, a lot of, a lot of things that might be pertinent to help pastors uh, grow personally, professionally, help their churches to grow, uh, and continue to provide those resources. So we do a number of things. We have spirit care because similarly, we don't like giving up on ministers when they are retired. Uh, and that provides financial assistance. We give as much as 150 bucks uh, to people to help them cover uh, medicines and Medicare uh, things. And we have a lot, of, a lot of things like that, but that is what we do. What we do are people like the, the pastor that ministered to my professor because those are the kind of people that make an impact that 25 years later can be the basis for teaching students, like me, how to care for people. And that's the value of pastors, and that's why we do what we do. Uh, Dr. Tim Manis is my, my uh, partner in crime over at Ministerial Care, and he's going to pray for you guys. Thanks so much. I want to pray the benediction, and I think it would be appropriate. Many of you know I am a counselor. I spend most of my time listening rather than speaking. One of the things I enjoy about Pentecostalism is listening to the prayers of others. My mom, my grandmother, people in the church, and there are so many prayers that are filled with such rich story. If you listen to those prayers, every prayer has a story to it. And so I want to read a little letter that a pastor wrote throughout the counseling process. He gave me permission to read this. I thought it would be appropriate to let this be our benediction from a pastor writing a prayer called Prayer for, prayer for Relief from Loneliness and Isolation. A pastor that I feel embodies a lot of pastors that Dr. Harold Bear and Dr. Layla Bear have helped throughout the years. Let's pray. In my struggles, Lord, I often feel alone. You say you are with me, but I can't always feel it. Sometimes I can be with the people and still feel all alone. Others don't understand what I'm going through, and it's hard for them to know what to do. And yet, this makes me feel even more isolated. You created us because you love us and want to be with us. You designed us to need you and others. Help me receive your loving presence. Help me see when you are moving on my behalf whether it's through other people, through hard steps I've taken, through your created beauty and nature, or through some way I would never expect. Lord, I need reminders, and I need revelations of your presence with me. Help me reach out to others when I need help. Encouragement. Give me courage 
to ask for what I need and the courage to offer the same for others. Heal my heart, Lord, and my mind in all the areas that keep me closed off, isolated, withdrawn, or defensive in relationships. I ask for your wisdom and spiritual discernment so I can see when you and your creation provide relief from loneliness. Amen. May we all be reminded to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Amen.